what's up, Pathway Student Ministries. Today we continue our Daniel series. We're in week seven, Daniel chapter three, and uh, really we're just going to jump right into it. Today, today we're going to see very clearly this challenge between conviction and compromise. Remember, that's the tagline of our series. It's our Daniel series, but really the title is Living with Conviction in a World of Compromise. We're going to see Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego for the first time here, or really the second time. Daniel 1, we, we saw them uh, and, and Daniel's friends, but, but here we see them very specifically mentioned, and they're, they're kind of famous part of the book of Daniel, and we're going to see how they lived with conviction instead of compromise. So jumping right into Daniel chapter 3, verses 1 through 18, just starting in verse 1. King Nebuchadnezzar made a gold statue 90 feet tall and 9 feet wide and set it up on the plain of Dura, in the province of Babylon. This is a gigantic statue. It's huge, 90 feet tall. Do you realize how tall 90 feet is? It's super tall, nine feet wide. Even that is huge, 90 feet tall and nine feet wide. You have to think that when Nebuchadnezzar is having this statue made, is he thinking about the dream that Daniel interpreted where he was the head of gold in this statue that talked about the kingdoms to come? And you have to wonder, do you think that the head of gold wasn't good enough? So he had to make a gold statue from head to toe of himself. It's a gigantic statue, and there's some precedent here for maybe why he built the statue. Now, 90 feet is huge. We've talked about that. There was not enough gold in the kingdom for it to be completely gold. What was likely is that this was a wooden statue carved out of wood and overlaid with gold. So even in the construction of this statue, it's putting on a false image. It's putting off a facade. It looks gold, but underneath it's wood. It's fake. It's not real. It's a false image. And Nebuchadnezzar is saying, hey, this false image, worship it. Here's where he goes. He says, then he sent messages to the high officers, officials, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the provincial officials to come to the dedication of the statue he had set up. So all these officials came and stood before the statue King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Honestly, the king wants everybody to be a part of this. He, he reaches out to the entire kingdom and says, hey, send your, your sheriffs and your mayors and your governors and your senators and representatives. Send, send everybody in a leadership position to come and worship this statue. I know not every citizen can be there, but every leader ought to be there to worship your king, the god, little g-god, Nebuchadnezzar. That's what he hopes for. This was quite a production. A lot of people were there, a lot of time and energy has been put into this. The king obviously knows how to put on a good show, and it, it continues. Not just people there, but now there's going to be some music there as well, it's turning into a music festival. Then a herald shouted, people of all races and nations and languages, listen to the king's command. When you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the zither, the, the lyre, the harp, the pipes, and other musical instruments, bow to the ground to worship King Nebuchadnezzar's gold statue. Anyone who refuses to obey will immediately be thrown into a blazing furnace. So at the sound of the musical instruments, all the people, whatever their race or nation or language, bowed to the ground and worshipped the gold statue that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Honestly, I look at all these instruments and I don't know what they all sound like together, but what we really do know from this is that this was not a, a cacophony of noises of instruments all together, but this was a worship service. This was Nebuchadnezzar using these instruments to lead his nation, to lead his kingdom in worship of himself. One commentator says this, he says, Nebuchadnezzar was wise to use instrumental music because it could stir the people's emotions and make it easy for him to manipulate them and win their submission and obedience. There were two choices. You can worship the golden statue of Nebuchadnezzar, or you can be immediately thrown into a fiery furnace. Which one would you choose? It honestly is, is a hard choice. Death or worship, but life, right? You worship the king, you worship a false image, but you're still alive to talk about it. It's interesting. These things, fear and, and religion and, and worship, have been used all throughout history to manipulate, to control, to grab at power. Nebuchadnezzar is using them for his control, for his kingdom, for his glory in these moments. He gives us another example that, that we are made to worship something. But honestly, we're not just made to worship something, we're made to worship someone 
the one true God. Nebuchadnezzar desires the worship of the people. He wants them to see him as a God. In those days, for most people groups and and most nations, this would not really have been that big of a deal. Honestly, they would have been used to looking at at their leaders as little g gods, as deities uh, in, in control and in leadership over them. So it would not have been that big of a deal for them to look at King Nebuchadnezzar and bow their knee in worship to him. But for the Israelites, for God's chosen people, it was a big deal. It was something that God had explicitly commanded them not to do because God calls for their exclusive worship. Again, God calls for their exclusive worship. In Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 through the the beginning of verse 5, it says, Then God gave the people all these instructions. I am the Lord your God, who rescued you from the land of Egypt, the place of your slavery. You must not have any other God but me. You must not make for yourself an idol of any kind or an image of anything in the heavens or on the earth or in the sea. You must not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God who will not tolerate your affection for any other gods. Can't really get away from it. Do not worship any other God. There is one God. That is God Almighty, the creator God, the sustainer of life, our Savior the one true God. This is the beginning of the Ten Commandments that God gives to his people. And the first two are very simple. Again, don't have any other God but the Lord and don't worship or make any idol or any image. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego would have known these commandments. And so the making of this image violated those commandments and the worship of this image would have violated those commandments. And so Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, hey, we're going to follow our God, not King Nebuchadnezzar. So here they are, these three Jews that we know of, in the middle of this great crowd of officials and leaders in the kingdom of Babylon. And and there in the crowd, people of every nation and tribe and tongue bowed and worshipped this image of King Nebuchadnezzar. Everyone was doing it, except for a few. The story continues in verse 8, but some of the astrologers, some of the Chaldeans, went to the king and informed on the Jews. They said to King Nebuchadnezzar, long live the king. You issued a decree requiring all the people to bow down and worship the gold statue when they hear the sound of the horn and flute and zither and lyre and harp and pipes and other musical instruments. That decree also states that those who refuse to obey must be thrown into a blazing furnace. There are some Jews, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, whom you have put in charge of the province of Babylon. They pay no attention to you, your majesty. They refuse. They refuse to serve your gods, and do not worship the gold statue you have set up. You can honestly feel them elevating themselves. You can feel them putting themselves up. These guys did this. They, the the Jews, weren't worshiping you, king, but but we were, your majesty. You can feel feel them doing that. And so Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they, they did not bend their knee and worship the statue. No matter the manipulation, how they felt about it, their opinions, what everybody else was doing the, the pressure from co-workers or peers or their friends that they held firm in their conviction. They didn't worship the gold statue. We could say it like this, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were disobedient to the king, but faithful to the king of kings in public, in private, and when no one else was watching. Again, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were disobedient to the king, but they were obedient to the king of kings in public, in private, and when no one was watching. What an example for us. What an example that we can follow. To know that every decision has consequences. We see that. And imagine if Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego hadn't been faithful. Imagine if they hadn't made the decision that they did. Well, look at the consequence of the decision they made, but think about what if they didn't? What if they took the easy road? What if they just did what everybody else around them was doing and they gave in and maybe they rationalized it and they said, hey, you know what? God's going to forgive us, so let's just not worry about dying today. Let's not worry about the blazing furnace. Let's not worry about the the fury of the king, but instead, let's just kind of just do what everybody else is doing and like just pretend like we're bowing our knee, but God, we're worshiping you. We're not worshiping the statue and just kind of like rationalize it in our hearts. They could have made that decision. It would have been the easier decision to make, the, the less controversial wouldn't have stirred up as much trouble or anguish for them. And yet what they knew is that their God had not called them 
to make such a decision. What they knew is that God had called them to be men of integrity, men of character, to faithfully follow the Lord their God. Just because he would forgive them didn't give them permission to disobey, didn't give them permission to sin. In fact, the Apostle Paul writes this in, in Romans chapter 5. At the end of Romans 5, he's talking about the grace of God and, and how amazing this grace is, and that where sin is, grace abounds all the more, meaning that, that God continues to forgive and continues to forgive and continues to forgive. And, and then the question came up, and Paul anticipates this question coming up in Romans 6, and he says this. He says, well then, should we keep on sinning so that God can show us more and more of his wonderful grace? It sounds great. It's like, oh, God is so gracious. Like, let us just even see more of his outpouring of grace by being disobedient so that he has to pour it out to us because we're not following him. Because we're sinning and choosing to sin and choosing to walk in rebellion to him, let's see how much grace he has because where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. Let's just continue to sin, right? Like, and Paul says, should we do that? Should we continue to sin so that grace might abound more and more? In verse 2, he says, of course not, with an exclamation point, right? You feel the intensity. He's like, obviously, that's not what you're supposed to do. Of course not. Do not do that. Since we have died to sin, how can we continue to live in it? Or have you forgotten that when we were joined with Christ Jesus in baptism, we joined him in his death? For we died and were buried with Christ by baptism. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we also may live new lives. Basically, Paul is saying that if you've died to sin, which is every believer in Jesus Christ, every follower of Jesus, then you can't continue to live in it. You're, you're not living in the new life if that's what you're doing. You're not experiencing intimacy with God the Father. You're not growing in faith or Christ-likeness. And if you continue sinning because God is gracious and will keep forgiving, you're missing the point, and you might not even be in relationship with God in the first place. We've been given new life in Christ, which means we have new desires, a new way of looking at and understanding the world, a new way of seeing and understanding our wants and desires in light of Christ. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were living as faithful followers of God. They are living examples of faith for us, showing us how to make hard decisions, to live with conviction in a world of compromise. The story continues in verse 13. The Nebuchadnezzar flew into a rage and ordered that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought before him. When they were brought in, Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you refuse to serve my gods or to worship the gold statue I have set up? I will give you one more chance to bow down and worship the statue I have made when you hear the sound of the musical instruments. But if you refuse, you will be thrown immediately into the blazing furnace. And then what God will be able to rescue you from my power? Evidently, Nebuchadnezzar had some kind of positive feeling towards these three because it was supposed to be immediately thrown into the blazing furnace, not given a second chance. But here he is giving them a second chance to worship him. One more time to bow down and worship the gold statue. Imagine the pressure. The first time you're in the crowd, which is pressure enough, but the second time you're face to face with the king who has the power to just like right now snap his fingers and you're dead. That's some intense pressure. Their conviction is being challenged and tested in an amazing way. How do they respond? Verses 16 through 18, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied, O oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God whom we serve is able to save us. He will rescue us from your power, your majesty. But even if he doesn't, we want to make it clear to you, your majesty, that we will never serve your gods or worship the gold statue you have set up. They respond again with faithfulness to their God and respect towards their king, still calling him your majesty, still respecting his position and his authority and understanding what he can do, but living with conviction. They lived with unwavering conviction in the face of death. They were willing to give up everything they had, including their lives, for the exclusive worship of their God. Again, they were willing to give up everything they had, including their lives, for the exclusive worship of their God. What are you willing to give up to follow God? It's our main idea. It's more a question than it is a statement. But what are you willing to give up to follow God? It doesn't mean God is going to call you to give that thing up. But the question becomes, what if he did ask you to give that up? 
Would you be willing if he asked you? Or does that thing, whatever it is, have more of your heart and affection than God does? Would you be willing to give up Netflix or Disney Plus or whatever it is, social media, a smartphone, a certain friendship, pursuing a certain dating relationship, a sport or certain activity? These aren't bad things. These aren't sinful things. But when they take the place of God as something that we're pursuing first and foremost in our lives, then it becomes an issue. It becomes an idol. It becomes something that we are bowing our knee in worship to over God. And that's not okay. We need to repent and and give that up. In person at, at youth group, we're going to give you an opportunity to, to write down some things and, and tear it off and throw it in the garbage. And, and so I want to invite you right now, where you are, to, to go get a piece of paper and a pen. And what I want you to do is, on that piece of paper, write down something that is getting in the way of you faithfully following God. What is in the way of that? What is in the way of you pursuing God? What is in the way of you loving the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength? What do you need to give up to follow him faithfully? Write it down on that piece of paper and then pray about that thing. Pray that God would release you from the grip and, and the power of whatever that is. Once you've done that, I want to invite you to, to crumple it up and throw it away. Throw it in the garbage. Be done with it. Be done with the old way of life and walk in newness of life. Pray again that God would release you from the grip of that and then tell somebody about it. Tell your mom or your dad or or text your small group leader or call someone. Let them know what you wrote down so that they can hold you accountable so that you don't go after that thing anymore. So you don't pursue that anymore, but instead you pursue the Lord first and foremost in your life. I want you to know that, that we're praying for you. You can let us know, and we'll pray with you. We'll pray for you. We'll do what we can to hold you accountable. And, uh, and we love you guys, and we'll see you next time.